I'm Cheryl Rainfield. Um, I write the books that I needed as a teen and I couldn't find. Uh, I write both realistic, edgy, young adult fiction uh, with a touch of suspense and also some young adult fantasy, uh, paranormal. I'm also queer. Um, I'm an incest survivor and a torture survivor. My parents were part of cults. Um, and I used self-harm to cope for a lot of those years. So I draw really heavily on my own trauma and my healing experience when I write my books. I wrote Scars, Stained, Hunted, uh, two high-low books, and high-low means they're high-interest, low vocabulary for reluctant readers. Um, as self-published, Parallel Visions, and I've been in a bunch of anthologies. These are just a few of them. <clears throat> so with um, my U.S. published books, these three that are uh, books of my heart, like that I put my soul into, um, so much of it, they all received awards or were finalists for awards. So Scars was the number one Yelsa uh, top 10 quick picks for reluctant readers. It was also on ALA's Rainbow Project list. It was a staff pick for Teaching Tolerance. And also it was a Governor General Literary Award finalist. Um, that's Canada's biggest uh, literary award. I'm in Canada. And Stained uh, was a Bank Street College uh, Center, uh, sorry, Bank Street College Center for Children's Literature's best book of the year. That's a big mouthful. It was also an Allen pick. Um, an SCBWI Crystal Crite Award, and Hunted. It was a finalist for the Monica Hughes um, Science Fiction and Fantasy Award, and also Ruth and Sylvia Schwartz Award. And uh, awards are really wonderful, and they make you feel good. Um, it's really lovely to get peer um, acceptance, but I think the thing that, my favorite thing that makes me feel the best is all the reader letters I get, um, telling me how my books helped them in some way. So SCARS has faced some challenges over the years, even though I know that it's helped save reader lives. But I'm not alone in that. A lot of writers who write about diversity or they write about painful issues, um, they faced challenges too, like Laurie Hales Anderson, who you may have heard of, Ellen Hopkins, Judy Bloom, Julianne Peters, as well as writers like Chris Crutcher, Sherman Alexi, uh, John Green, tons of um, writers that you've probably heard of. But there is a really huge need for young adult books that talk about um, diversity or um, painful issues that teens are living now, like uh, sexual assault and rape, like attempted suicide and self-harm, um, like racism and homophobia and sexism and ageism and ableism. Like, we need books that um, that counteract some of those harmful things and that help us make sense of those horrible things. I think when we're alone, we have so much pain, but when we know that we're not alone, we feel lighter and stronger and books can help us feel less alone. And books can also help us increase empathy and compassion for other people, but also for ourselves. So for abused kids and queer kids and kids facing racism and bullying, I mean, books can be a lifeline. It can be um, their way to know that they're not alone, but also that what's happened is not their fault or it's not a weakness. And books were a huge part of my survival of my childhood and my teenhood. They were my only safety. Books were my way to realize that, you know, hey, these characters are surviving and they're thriving through really horrible things, so maybe I can too. So I could hope that things would get better. And books were my way to know that not everyone was as horribly abusive as my family was. So I don't think I could have survived my childhood and my teenhood without books. And I think there's still a lot of teens today who um, feel that way too. And I feel that it's uh, deeply wrong to prevent a child or a teen from getting a book that they need or that might help them. Yet there's this huge pushback against books that deal with diversity and painful issues. And people who ban books, they say they're doing it to protect children. I think 
people who ban books, that they're doing it um, out of their own fear and out of their own prejudice and their inability to deal with their own emotion or their own trauma or that of someone else that they know. Um, I think it's also, they have a, if we pretend that it's not happening, it won't really be happening mentality. Or also, if they, they think that like, if they silence the people that are talking about oppression or diversity, that maybe those ideas won't catch on. And maybe people won't like uprise against everything and, and fight for equality and safety and justice for everyone. Because books are powerful. Uh, my first experience with, personal experience with one of my books being challenged was when a librarian at the Boone County Library told me that Scars was being challenged by a patron who said that um, Scars could make a teen who was self-harming or who used to self-harm hurt themselves. And that was shocking to me because Scars is about healing. And in Scars, I talk about how painful it is and all the problems that are caused when someone is self-harming. And I show how desperately this teen, um, who was basically me, wanted to stop cutting. So it made no sense to me at all. And also, I've received hundreds of letters from teens over the years telling me that star Scars helped them stop cutting or talk to someone for the first time about their self-harm or about being queer, or about being an abuse survivor. And, um, sorry, I got distracted. Um, they've also told me that, you know, it, it has even helped them keep from killing themselves. So I knew that that didn't make sense. And I also knew that it was a myth to think that um, if you hear about, or you see, or you read about self-harm, that you're going to go do it. Uh, in the many years that I was cutting myself, I was around some other survivors who had also hurt themselves. And I saw their wounds, and never once did my seeing their injuries um, make me want to hurt myself. What made me want to hurt myself was my own overwhelming emotional pain, and my, um, my trying not to kill myself. Like, I used to cut to keep from killing myself. And my abuse and trauma, like all those are why I cut, but it was not because of someone else's self-harm. Of course, any content can be triggering because um, triggers are based on our own personal experience and backgrounds and our own trauma history too. Um, but it's up to us to deal with our triggers and to deal with our mental health. So a book upsets you, you put it down, but you don't tell everyone else, hey, you can't read it because I can't deal with it, right? That makes no sense. So I was really grateful that the librarian told me about the challenge to Scars. I was able to take it on social media, on Twitter, on my blog, and I asked people for support to keep Scars in the library. And I got a lot of support online, like so much. It was really lovely. Um, I had readers who were calling the Boone County Library and saying, hey, you need to keep Scars in the library. And I had readers who saying um, that they were picking up a second copy of Scars and they were giving it to a friend who needed it or keeping it in the classroom. Um, or even some people who'd never heard of Scars and never read it, but heard about it because of this, and they bought a copy. So I think all of that, making that public, putting it on social media, I think that's part of what helped keep Scars in the library because the Boone County Library kept it in. I was so grateful. Um, but the other part was having this incredible librarian who was willing to fight for um, the teens who needed scars and needed access to it and who let me know about it and who helped me um, talk about it. My next experience with censorship um, happened only a few months later when the Wall Street Journal published an article saying that um, books that were young adult books that were about edgy, gritty, uh, or realistic subjects were too dark for the teens and that they were rife with depravity and um, explicit violence and abuse. And she targeted a lot of authors and a lot of books. And one of the books that she targeted was Scars by me. And she said that um, teens who read books about self-harm like Scars would go and cut themselves even if they never had before. And again, this was shocking to me because nobody goes out and hurts themselves just because they hear, oh, someone else has done it. Like self-harm hurts too much and it causes so many problems and issues, and it, it's, you don't do it just because you hear about it. 
uh, the reasons someone self-harms are overwhelming emotional pain uh, or another emotion that's overwhelming that there's no outlet for. And um, often abuse and trauma in, the, in their person's history. So many people read that article and there was a huge fuss about it. Um, I, of course, wrote a blog post and put it on social media and so did a lot of the other authors who were targeted, including uh, Laurie House Anderson, who wrote Speak and Twisted, uh, Maureen Johnson, Sherman Alexi, Jennifer Brown. I hope you've heard of some of these authors because they're really good. And book bloggers and readers and reviewers and even literary agents and publishers, they all spoke out against this article. And a young adult author, Maureen Johnson, she started this, y, this hashtag called YA Saves on Twitter. She said, basically, hey, you guys, if you've read a YA book that helped save you, like, let us know and let us know how. And so many people responded on Twitter with their stories about how young adult books saved them that YA Saves hashtag became the number three trending topic in the U.S. on that day. Like, books help us. And also, um, some organizations, ALA, OIF, and YELSA, they all wrote a joint article together in response to the Wall Street Journal article, and they sent it to them. And the Wall Street Journal did not publish it. So ALA did online, and again, that helped raise awareness. And I think that using social media to, to talk about a challenge really helps more people become aware of what's happening. But I've also been told a number of times by people uh, years after it happened how SCARS was removed quietly from the shelves. And if teachers and librarians, if they don't feel that they can fight back, if they don't feel that they can tell the author whose book is being challenged or um, a book organization that can help them fight against the censorship, then often those books just disappear off the shelves. And the teens who need them, they don't get access to them. So. Um, kids where that book might have saved their life or it might have helped them talk to someone sooner or heal faster or find community sooner. They just don't get the book. There was also some censorship that I wish I'd been more vocal about that happened. Um, I was disinvited from speaking at a conference because some of the conference organizers didn't like the subject of my books. And like, I wasn't sure if that meant, oh, they don't like the queer characters or the sexual abuse survivors and physical abuse or the ones who self-harmed. But that was disturbing to me and upsetting. And then there was also an anthology that I was in where just like a couple months before publication, they removed my essay because I was talking about my own abuse and trauma in the essay. Censorship can be insidious. So what can you do if a book is challenged? Well, even before a book is challenged, I think it helps to build community around you that will help support you and um, fight with you when a book is challenged, and you're very likely to get a book challenge. And it also helps to educate yourself about banned books and to help other people learn about banned books. So take part in Banned Book Week, which happens every year, but also if you could talk about banned books other times of the year, we'd all appreciate it. It would be lovely. Uh, you could also, of course, and please do, support authors whose books have been challenged, other libraries and schools where there's been a challenge. And when you make a course list, um, consider adding just like even a sentence or two about why the book is important. That will help parents when they're reading it and encourage those parents to like read the book with their kids and talk about it with them. That will probably help lessen the, the challenges. And if a book is in the process of being challenged, you still have the chance to prevent that challenge from becoming formal or happening. And one of the things that can help diffuse a challenge is to listen respectfully and thoughtfully to the person who's making the challenge, even if you vehemently disagree with them. And of course, respond calmly and respectfully to what they're saying. Um, you could let them know that you their concerns are being taken seriously. Just don't agree with their concerns, but but tell them that you're taking it seriously, because you are. And you could suggest alternative books for them, um, books that would fit their taste better. And then if they still request that the book is removed, um, you could say that while they're offended by the book, that's not everyone's opinion. And that a library or a classroom or a school is meant for all users. And that means um, diverse population and diverse experiences. 
and every parent or guardian has the right to decide which books are appropriate for their own children. Their own children, right? Not, not everybody's children, their own children. If they still want the book removed, um, you could explain the process of having a book challenge. So the forms they have to fill out and sign, which identifies them, and submit before anything even starts to happen. And you could also talk about the timeline because it can take a while. There has to be a review committee. And just those things alone may help diffuse, um, diffuse the situation and keep them from doing it. Because sometimes all a person wants is to have their concerns heard or their worries heard and acknowledged. And other times people are acting out of like anger or just an, um, being impulsive and they don't want to wait for like months to have a decision. So again, that can help. Uh, you may also, if there's a challenge, have to educate like the school board or um, the library board about intellectual freedom uh, and the importance of diversity in books or just about censorship. But you don't have to do all of this alone. There are organizations that you can contact to help you when a book is challenged, like the National Council of Teachers of English, which is NCTE, the American Library Association, ALA, and also the National Coalition Against Censorship, NCAC. All of them have online forms that you can use to report a specific book that's been challenged and why. And they have articles and advice on like what to do next. They offer support. And ALA and NCAC, they both offer advocacy for you. Uh, you could also download the NCAC's Book Censorship Action Kit. It has a ton of ideas on what you can do when you're facing book censorship. And they also have a Defend LGBTQ uh, resource, a downloadable PDF, and it has also uh, really specific um, arguments against homophobia that can help you. I think one of the easiest, most impactful ways to reach many people at once um, to tell them about a, book, about a book challenge is social media. And so if you're going to talk on social media, it helps if you talk as honestly and as openly as you can about why the book was challenged and which book it is. And use hashtags because you want to gain like the biggest audience that you can. So think about like YA Lit um, as a hashtag and ban books. And you could also use the title of the book that's being challenged and the author's name that's being challenged. And you could tag the author. You could also tag like ALA or NCAC, like any organizations that would help you. And because it's online, um, visuals are going to attract attention. So think about making a photo the way some uh, librarians or teachers do during Banned Book Week, uh, where they wrap like the yellow caution tape around the book that's being challenged, or um, a chain and a padlock. You could also make an image quote um, out of a banned book quote, or you could just download a pre-made graphic from ALA or NCTC, but graphics help. And I really think it helps to tell the author whose book is being challenged. Lori House Anderson wrote a letter to the committee of a school where Twisted was removed from the classroom. And she talked about why she wrote Twisted and what she assumed the concerns of the parents were, and she addressed those. And she talked about how Twisted helped her target audience, which was teen boys, and she included excerpts from letters that they'd written her. And she also pointed to the awards that she'd gotten. And I loved this quote from her letter. Banned books does not protect teens. It condemns them to ignorance and it puts them in danger. Laurie Hells Anderson's book Speak, uh, which is about sexual assault, it receives a lot of challenges too. And so she wrote a post about that on her website. And she talked about why it's important to have books that talk about painful issues and how her book can help prepare teens or help them to um, ask for help. And isn't that what we want kids to do? Like she made it personal. We want our kids to ask for help. She also included uh, stats on sexual assault and that teens already know what rape is, right? They know it from the news, but far too many know about it from personal experience. And that removing a book that's talking about sexual assault in a thoughtful way is actually harmful. NCAC also wrote um, a letter in support of Speak uh, not being removed, right? 
And I like this, uh, this quote, they said that the Supreme Court cautioned that local school boards may not remove books from library shelves simply because they dislike the ideas contained in those books. Okay, that's really good to remember. Ellen Hopkins books, um, which deal with a lot of painful subjects too, like uh, suicide and gun violence and drug addiction and teen prostitution, they've often been challenged. And she was also disinvited from a conference, to speak at a conference. And she was so mad about that, that she wrote this anti-censorship poem. It's really strong and powerful. And uh, Ban Books Week, the organization, they loved it so much that they used it as their manifesto for a few years, which I think is pretty cool. She's also very vocal, um, speaking up about censorship on her blog, on social media, um, on interviews, and I really respect her for that. I think when authors get involved with fighting against um, challenges to their own books, it helps increase the visibility of that challenge and it makes it more likely that the book is going to remain on the shelves. And I think that's true too of um, engaging the help of book organizations. And I also think that you can get some really great ideas from authors who've already had book challenges and also, of course, the, the anti-censorship book organizations. You could also contact news outlets. Uh, you could start a petition, thinklikechange.org. Uh, you could write letters to officials about why the book is important, uh, why it's needed. And if you do that, um, if the book has won any awards, you want to point to them. And if there's been some positive reviews, that's going to help too. Um, just remember that in this, you're not alone. You have community, you have these book organizations that can help you, but you're also going to have your students. <laughs> students can help. They can actually do a lot. Um, students can contact NCAC also themselves, and they can download Kids Right to Read Action Kit, which has a ton of ideas on how kids can fight back against censorship. They can start a petition, these kids. They can get on social media and start their own hashtag. They can organize a discussion at school, contact the news themselves. They can start a protest, or they could even start a letter writing campaign. So if you can prevent a book from being challenged, you've done a wonderful thing. You may have even saved a life. And even if you couldn't prevent the book from being removed from the shelves, if you made that book challenge public, then you increased the awareness about that book, about um, book banning, that it still happens, because some people don't believe it still happens. Um, and you may have helped a teen find a book that they need. So either way, you fought for the freedom to read, you fought for kids to read books that they need and books that reflect their own experiences. And I think that those kids and the authors will thank you.